The concept for Purple Rain started back in 1982 during the 1999 tour where Prince started writing down the ideas for a film in the little notebook that he kept on his tour bus. He presented the idea of wanting to do a film to his management team, letting them know that this would be a deal breaker when it came time to renegotiate his contract with Warner Brothers. Around the same time period, Prince had an unannounced meeting with Mo Austin as he felt 1999 was a superior project to Michael Jackson's album Thriller, which was making historical numbers in sales at the time. He believed the reason for that was because his record label was doing a lot better job as far as promoting the project. Mo politely explained to him that the reason that Thriller was selling is because Michael Jackson has a team behind him to make his projects where you, sir, have chose to do everything by yourself. If you would like to make a Thriller album, I can get you Rod Temperton and Quincy Jones because I know Rod and Quincy, the writer and producer of the album Thriller. Of course, Prince's response was basically, F you, I'm gonna go ahead and do it by myself. After this heated conversation, Mo Austin came to the realization that, holy crap, uh, I need to go and actually renegotiate this guy's contract here in a couple weeks and this probably isn't going to go very well. So he went to Prince's management team and was like, hey, what do we need to do money-wise, reimbursements, like gifts, like what do we need to do to keep him actually with Warner Brothers? And they told him that the deal breaker is he wants a movie. Prior to this discussion, while Prince was still writing his script, his manager, Robert Cavoli, started doing some of the legwork to look for someone that would actually go ahead and produce this film in case they had to go the independent route, being that, you know, maybe Warner Brothers won't want to do this. And he was afraid that this was going to be a difficult task to begin with because he's trying to pitch a musician-led film. And just like he thought, every production company he went to in Hollywood and around the States pretty much turned them down, including David Geffen's company and Richard Pryor's company. In the end, Prince's management team sat down with Mo Austin and went over the pitch of the film, which to their surprise, he was good to go with it and gave them a budget so they can go ahead and get the film greenlit. Robert Cavallo hired William Blinn, the writer and executive producer of the TV series Fame, to go ahead and write the script. Initially, the plan was for him to sit down and collaborate with Prince, but they really didn't agree on anything, including the title of the film, which William Blinn had written the script as Dreams, which Prince did not like that title whatsoever. So he went ahead and just took Prince's notebook that he had written the script in and went back to his own place and finished the script all on his own. While this was going on, they began casting for the movie and the management team went ahead and ran out a warehouse so they could do dance rehearsals and have acting classes as most of the cast had never acted before. These are the infamous classes that Morris Day got kicked out of as he kept acting the fool every time he was there and was the first time that he almost got fired from this film. William Blinn eventually finished the script to the movie and handed it to Prince's management team and basically said, bye, I gotta go because my show Fame just got renewed for another season and I'm not gonna have anything to do with the rest of this movie. So with his script in hand, Prince's management team went looking for a director. They first approached James Foley, the director of the film Reckless, but he was not interested in William Blinn's script whatsoever but was nice enough to give them a suggestion, and that was his editor, Albert Magnoli. Although Albert had only done a short film on his own, James Foley's recommendation was enough for them to go ahead and pitch the idea to him. Initially, Albert turned down the opportunity to direct the film because he hated William Blinn's script so much, but then again, his script was very dark and depressing and filled with an abundance of violence. Being that they were getting down to the wire here, they went ahead and offered him the option to go ahead and rewrite the script himself and essentially make whatever movie he wanted to make. Under these conditions, Albert went ahead and signed on as the director of the film. Albert would go on to rewrite pretty much the entire script, leaving very little of William Blim's original script left, but they are both still credited as writers for the film. About three weeks into pre-production, Vanity quit the film. Not only did she quit the film, but she also broke up with Prince and left the group Vanity 6. The entire production team went into panic mode as now they're getting ready to film and they need to find a new lead actress. Their first option was to go direct to Jessica Beals and offer her the part, but she was technically not acting anymore as her focus was on her college career. So they went ahead and did an open audition and after auditioning several hundred women, 
Prince chose Patricia Cotero. Prince would go and christen her Apollonia. She had done a few TV shows and a couple TV movies prior to this role. With the exception of Apollonia and Prince's character's parents, Olga, Carlotas, and Clarence William III, nobody in the cast had previous acting experience, as the rest of the cast was made up of Prince's bandmates, artists, and touring personnel. Filming started November 1st, 1983. They did all the exterior shots first, being that they're filming in Minnesota. And in case you didn't know, Minnesota gets really, really cold. This is also why Apollonia would end up getting hypothermia for the lake scene as she jumped in the water multiple takes. Morris Day was a constant problem on set as during this time in his life, he was hooked on cocaine and was pretty much an alcoholic. He started to miss several days of filming, causing the production team to reschedule different shots because he was not available. It got to the point where they actually hired a team to go look for him every day, sober him up, and get him on set. This was the second time he almost got fired from this film. Filming took 39 days, finishing up on December 16th, 1983, with some exterior establishing shots being completed in January of 1984. Purple Rain was released July 27th, 1984, it was made for only $7 million and grossed over $70 million at the box office. The film opens up with the beginning dialogue from the song Let's Go Crazy, giving us the title of the film right before they break into the full performance of the song, the song being performed by The Revolution, fronted by Prince's character The Kid. While the performance is going on, we get several flashes of different people as well as the crowd letting us know that we are deep, deep in the 1980s. The performance continues on, giving us clips of how everyone got to this show. Those clips include the revolution warming up, the kid doing his makeup, Morris Day vacuuming in his drawers, and Apollonia running out on a cab fee only to have a wad of cash to pay for a really crappy hotel room. We do get an establishing shot to let us know that her crappy hotel is right across the street from the club First Avenue where the performance is currently going on. Although in real life, First Avenue is in Minneapolis, and her crappy hotel is actually in Los Angeles, but movie magic. Apollonia tries to get into the club as she needs to talk to the manager, and of course the giant monster known as Chick, Prince's real bodyguard, is playing the bouncer in this club, and he's not letting her in as the manager doesn't talk to anybody. Of course a fight breaks out in the club which takes his attention away from her, and she sneaks in anyways where she physically runs into Jill, played by Jill Jones. Jill explains to her that the manager is gone, but if you want to leave your info, go ahead, and I can go ahead and post it on the board for you, and he'll give you a call. During this conversation, she catches the kid performing on stage and is completely mesmerized by him. They finish up their song, and the kid gets off stage and gets stopped by Jerome and Morris Day, two of the members of the group The Time, as they are about to get on stage, and they go ahead and give him some smack talk right before they do that. And their group gets announced by like the creepiest announcer guy of all time. And I'm sure this guy is probably a super nice guy in real life, but this dude looks creepy on this film. The Time performs the song Jungle Love. While their performance is going on, Prince notices Apollonia and Apollonia notices him. And instead of just walking up and talking to her, he becomes a weirdo who puts on his shades in the club and just stands behind her saying nothing. By the time she gets some courage to actually say something to him, she turns around and he's already disappeared. We then cut to the kid going to his house and we get introduced for the first time to his parents who are having a very violent fight when he walks in. He tries to go ahead and break up the fight after his dad smacks his mom and he ends up getting smacked and knocked down the floor himself. We transition to the next day and Billy and Morris are walking down the street and this is a meeting that the kid was supposed to be at but apparently he had a bad night with his parents and wasn't able to make the meeting. We find out that Billy, the owner of the club, is sick and tired of the music and the performances that the kid is doing and is actually looking to get rid of him. That's when Morris comes up with this idea as, hey, what if I go ahead and put together a real you know, commercial group, something that sells every night, in particular a girl group. Billy likes the idea and Morris goes ahead and says, hey, so if I bring you this group and you like them, then we're going to go ahead and kick the kid out, right? During the discussion, we do get some insight on the kid's father, whose name is Francis L. He apparently was once a really great musician, but ended up ruining his career and ruining his wife's career, the kid's mom, who was allegedly a singer at one time. We cut back to the club where the kid is showing up for rehearsal, but None of his bandmates are there because, as usual, he's late. But Jill is there and she gives him a tape of a song that Wendy and Lisa, two of the members of the revolution, wrote. He's really confused as why they didn't give it to him directly. And she was like, well, 
I heard it, wanted to continue to listen to it. So they were like, hey, when you're done with it, just make sure you give it to him. We then transition over to a warehouse where there's some rehearsals going on and we get the first look at Morris's girl group. The two members that are there are working on choreography, which Morris and Jerome are not very happy with. So they end up just leaving that rehearsal. As they're walking, they discuss the idea of bringing Apollonia on as the lead singer of the group. Before they are interrupted by a young lady that Morris was supposed to call last night, she goes ahead and cusses him out. And the way that they deal with it is he has Jerome throw her in a dumpster. We flash to a mall where Apollonia is standing in front of a display looking at some clothes when the kid comes up behind her and just asks for her chain on her boot, which she hands to him and he just walks off with it. So she goes ahead and chases him down and she finds him standing in front of a display looking at a new guitar. He goes ahead and throws her chain back to her and the two of them leave and now we go to a driving montage of them in the countryside. They stop at a lake and have a little bit of small talk about the music business. She goes ahead and asks if he's willing to help her get into the music business, which he replies no, and she's like, why? And he's like, well, because you're not going to pass the initiation. She's like, what initiation? He goes, well, first off, for starters, you have to purify yourself in the waters of Lake Minnetonka. Of course, she looks at the lake right next to her, assuming that's the lake. So she goes ahead and takes off all her clothes and takes a dive into the lake only for the kid to explain to her that that's not Lake Minnetonka. And he gets on his bike and drives off. Of course, she's freaking out thinking he just left her wet and naked, but he comes back around letting her know that it was a joke. She goes ahead and gets on the back of his bike and she gives him a kiss. We then flash back to the club where Jerome is polishing Morris's shoes and they're working on coming up with some type of password to let Morris know that Apollonia is in the building. This leads to the infamously funny what's the password scene. Okay, what's the password? You got it. Got what? The password. Password is what? Exactly. We then transition to the main stage at First Avenue where the Modernaires are performing. We then flash to the Revolution's dressing room where Wendy asks the kid in front of the rest of the band, hey, did you listen to our tape? Based on the look on his face, Lisa could tell that he did not listen to it whatsoever. Wendy goes ahead and goes off on him, really giving him the business, and he just goes ahead and makes fun of them for it. They both storm out, adding more tension to the band. We then flash back out to the main club, where Jerome lets Morris know that Apollonia is in the building, and he goes ahead and gets a table set up for the two of them. Morris does his chili sauce routine on Apollonia, trying to win her affections. We then cut back to the Revolution's dressing room, where the kid is doing his ventriloquist routine, before being told by one of the stagehands that, hey, it's time to go on stage. On his way to the stage, he notices that Apollonia is sitting with Morris. The Revolution performs the song, The Beautiful Ones, and the kid basically sings it directly to Apollonia. The song moves her and Morris can tell that he has lost this round. Apollonia waits for the kid at his motorcycle and they both head off to his house. There we get to see some sexual playfulness between the two of them, right before transitioning into their love scene. He drops her off at the hotel the next morning and heads over to his rehearsal where it's only Lisa and Wendy as once again he's late so the rest of the band left. He goes ahead and asks them, well why are you two still here? And they're like, well we're here working on our own solo music, which he gets really upset about and says, look, you can do that all you want, but I'm not going to do your stupid music. We transition to Morris stopping Apollonia in the streets and asking her if she would like to join his girl group. She agrees to go ahead and at least talk about it if he could help her find a good pawn shop. We move to the next scene of the kid sitting alone in his bedroom when he decides to go ahead and grab Wendy and Lisa's tape and start playing it. Of course, this gets interrupted by his parents bursting in his room as they are once again fighting. His dad slaps his mom to the ground and he goes ahead and breaks up the fight by tackling his dad. His dad gets up to leave the room and tells his wife, I would die for you. His mom is laying on his bed crying and he reaches out to try to console her. Prince had said many times that this was the hardest scene to film as he had had this same exact moment with his mother on several different occasions. The kid is awakened by Apollonia crawling into his room and she has a very large package. It's actually a gift for him. She gives it to him and tells him to open it. When he opens it up, it's the guitar that he was looking at in the mall. Being moved by the whole situation, he takes off his hoop earring and gives it to her as a way of saying thank you. She then announces to him that she is joining Morris's girl group which he replies with a smack to her face. Of course, Apollonia storms out and the kid is left pondering about what he has just done as he is now starting to become his father. We then transition to the next morning at the club where once again, the kid is late to rehearsal. This time the entire band is there minus Lisa and Wendy. But before he could even start rehearsal, he gets interrupted by Chick who lets him know that, hey, Billy wants to see you right now. Billy tells him about the new group Apollonia 6 that Morris has put together and that he really doesn't have the room on his schedule to have another group 
basically insinuating to him that you're about to go. We then transition to a musical montage set to the song When Doves Cry. It's a mixture of him driving around on his motorcycle and reflecting on what he's been through. Showing scenes that we've seen in the film and showing scenes that we have not seen in the film. But I'll get into that towards the end of this review. He heads home and sees his mom sitting on the curb and she's beat up pretty bad this time. So he goes right back home, comes in the house and he's ready to fight his dad and he's looking all over for him and cannot find him. But then he hears some music playing and he goes downstairs and he finds out that it's his dad actually playing music, which apparently he had told him that he would never do again. During the conversation with his dad, he asks, hey, is this your music? And he's like, yeah, of course it's mine. He's like, well, can I see like the song sheet on it? And he goes, no, there's no song sheets. I don't write these down. I don't have to. I'm not like you. Basically let him know that I'm a greater musician than you are. The kid changes the subject by asking about his mom. He changes the subject by asking him if he has a girlfriend, which he kind of shrugs off like, yeah. And he delivers one of the coldest lines ever. And get married. We transition to First Avenue where the revolution is playing the song Computer Blue. The kid's riff that he's playing is identical to the song he just heard his dad playing on the piano. As they start to close the song, the kid sees that Apollonia is coming in with Morris. Out of anger, he performs the song Darling Nikki, a song about a very loose lady and he sings it directly to her, making her cry and run out of the club. He storms off and has a complete meltdown in the dressing room right before Billy comes in and goes off on him and lets him know that this stage is no place for your personal business and explains to him that he's ruining his career just like his dad did. Again, letting him know that he's becoming more like his father. We move on to the next night where we get to see the debut of Apollonia 6 at a small club. They're performing the song Sex Shooter and the crowd is loving every bit of it. The kid is in the back watching the performance and he notices that Apollonia is noticing him and lets him know by pulling on the hoop earring that he had given her. Billy's at the club too and lets him know that hey, if your performance ain't top notch, you're out. We then flash the parking lot where there's a drunk Morris and a drunk Apollonia walking to his car. The language he's using, the way he's acting is he's pretty much going to try to take advantage of her. But out of the darkness on his motorcycle comes the kid and he knocks over Morris Day and takes her with him. The two of them end up by the train tracks and they get into a physical altercation. She gets up and walks away only to stop and to take off his hoop earring and throw it back at him. And then I'm assuming she finds a cab and gets home safe because we don't ever find out how she got back home because, you know, plot holes. We then flash over to the kid arriving at his home. The door has been busted down. The coffee table, which is glass, has been shattered. And there's like debris everywhere, telling us all that a horrible fight just happened in this house. So he goes ahead and starts investigating, trying to find his parents. And when he turns on the light to the basement, his dad shoots himself in the head. <laughs> then we go into scenes of commotion of medics and police everywhere throughout the house. We see his dad get put in an ambulance and his mom actually follows him in there. And then we see him sitting down with the police as they're questioning him about what had happened. And then everything pretty much goes silent. And it's just the kid sitting in the basement, constantly staring at his dad's chalk line. We then get flashes back and forth of his face, the chalk line, his face, the chalk line. You can tell that he's slowly going into madness when he finally breaks because he visions himself being hung in the basement. This vision makes him snap and he destroys the entire basement. He's knocking things over, knocking shelves down, he's hitting stuff with a hockey stick and then he throws a box in the air and the box opens and all these papers start flying out and he realizes that it's his dad's sheet music of all his songs. Almost as if his dad left this music for him is like a suicide note. This calms him down enough that he passes out, waking up on the basement floor the next morning. You can tell there's a change about him and he gets up and walks over to the other room and starts playing Wendy and Lisa's song. He's playing it over and over again, rewinding, stop, rewind, stop. And then he actually performs it himself on the piano showing that he actually is a talented enough musician like his father that he can play by ear. We transition over to First Avenue where the time is now on stage performing and the revolution is sitting in their dressing room in silence. Obviously everyone has heard what has happened. After the time finishes up their song, they start walking down the hallway to the dressing room singing a parody of Let's Go Crazy, stopping by the revolution's dressing room and asking, how's the family? Everyone in the time is laughing hysterically, but as they walk off, Moore stays behind. He has a look on his face as, you know what, that was not right. The Revolution get up to go perform what may be their very last song, and the camera zooms in to show that the kid is carrying the guitar for the first time that Apollonia had got him. They get on stage to a silent crowd. 
giving you the understanding that the entire crowd has also heard the news. The kid approaches the mic and tells everyone that this song is dedicated to his dad and that this song was written by two of the members of the band, Wendy and Lisa. Of course, Wendy and Lisa are shocked that he's actually letting them play their music and the kid goes ahead and gives them the nod to go ahead and start the song and we go into the song, Purple Rain. The crowd is mesmerized by the song and he even gets a nod from Billy while the song is being performed. But the kid doesn't notice any of this as he's completely lost in the song as he just pours out every emotion from himself. He realizes he's lost his way and he's hurt many people emotionally and physically. He's sorry and he wants forgiveness but understands that he may not get forgiveness and he's okay with being rejected. The song he's singing simply says, look, I wish the best for you in life and at least I'll get to see you again in heaven. Once the song is complete, he runs off stage completely unaware of how the song has affected the people. As in his mind, he thinks he's just failed and he runs to get on his motorcycle before all of a sudden hearing the crowd roaring. He comes back and bumps into Jill who's now in absolute tears and starts his way down the hallway to get back on stage which is filled with a bunch of cheering fans and at the very end is Apollonia who is crying. He walks over to her and she gives him a kiss and he makes his way back on stage and performs the song I Would Die For You and Baby I'm A Star. During these two performances we get clips of basically the story being wrapped up. We get to see him clean up the basement and organizing his dad's songs. He visits his dad in the hospital who is apparently recovering from a gunshot to the head and his mom is there laying on his lap. In the basement he finds the hoop earring that he had given Apollonia on the floor. He picks it up and throws it in the air only for Apollonia to snatch it out of the air as she's in the basement with him. The two of them embrace and kiss. The final performance ends with the crowd absolutely loving them even showing that Billy and Morris are dancing to his music. The final shot of the movie is Prince picking up a guitar and stroking it so that water shoots out the end of it, basically simulating you know what. And then credits roll. I keep mentioning the hoop earring because it actually has more of a significance in this film than what we get in the final cut of the film. In the original script and in a deleted scene, that earring was actually given to him by his mother during a very serious conversation he was having with her. But then again, several scenes were cut from the film and most of the dialogue was cut in half. The person that got the worst was unfortunately Jill Jones. Her character was actually a main part of the film and she had a nice character arc as she was this person that was infatuated with the kid but never had the courage to actually talk to him so she always gave him gifts and at one time even tried to give him a dog in the film. And she also had a musical number that was cut out as well. And she had much longer conversations with Apollonia as well as the other waitresses, including the one that got thrown in the dumpster earlier in the film. Being that the film was originally given an X rating, a lot of the violence and sex scenes were cut out or at least edited down. Some of these edits though were also for language as there was originally a lot more foul language. These edits and corrections were done in post, which is why you'll notice when it comes to the dialogue, what they're saying on their lips doesn't always match up to what's being heard. The scene where the kid goes to where Apollonia 6 is rehearsing and tries to take Apollonia away, only for the kid to get beat up by Jelly Bean Johnson was obviously supposed to be in the film as it's in the trailer but was cut out. Same for the infamous barn scene which was in the trailer, the When Doves Cry music video, and the driving montage in the film itself. And it was apparently the inspiration for the song Raspberry Beret, but it was cut out to keep an R rating. And to keep an R rating, they also cut down all the fights between his parents in half. But I know somewhere out there, maybe in Prince's Vault, maybe in a Warner Brothers storage bin, or maybe in one of the film's performers' basements, there's this footage. All this footage is still available somewhere and they need to find it, remaster it, and put it back in the film and release an uncut version of this movie. And who knows, maybe for the 40th anniversary of this film, we'll actually get an uncut version of it released. We can only hope from here. Thank you for joining me on the channel. Please like and share this video as much as possible. And as always, please subscribe to the channel so you can stay up to date on all the new episodes being dropped. And until that next episode, I wish you heaven.